My name is Ron Rivers. I, uh, it's great to connect with you. And I am uh, I'm the author of Self-Actualization in the Age of Crisis, which is a book that develops new frameworks of meaning and value uh, informed by cosmology and physics. Uh, a core part of the text is binding spiritual renaissance to systemic reformation, uh, which I argue is a necessary component of transcendence. Um, and I'm also the co-founding member of Spirit Dow, which is a small but growing community of people who are embracing uh, the philosophies and practices kind of outlined in the text. Um, while I did originally publish the book, it is a living document, and, and we can kind of dive into what that, that actually means uh, in a bit. Uh, but yeah, that's a short summary of, of where I am and, and uh, what I'm presently focusing on. Nice. Yeah, I'd be interested, like, why, why did you decide to reach out to me? Like, what? Yeah. So I, initially, I saw your interview with Akira the Don, mm. uh, and I've been listening to Akira the Don for some time. Um, so then I just kind of you know it perused your your uh, other interviews and guests, and uh, obviously I think you interview an, an eclectic group of people. But I said, you know, why not um, reach out? I've been um, doing a, a fair amount of podcasts. Uh, I have some university speaking coming up. Um, and I've been speaking at conferences. So I'm really just trying to kind of connect with people who uh, are interested in new ideas. I, that was kind of a, a theme I got from your, your work and your efforts was that you were kind of exploring um, ideas on the peripheral, on the fringe. So I, I thought this would be a good kind of connection. And, uh, you know, I, to be candid, I, I always just like to talk to, to people who've never heard about it before to get a perspective. I mean, the the book dives pretty deep into the the not only the science, but also the philosophy behind it. So it presents a kind of a new context. Um, so any opportunity to connect with someone who's interested in, in learning new things and exploring you know, alternative visions of the good uh, is an opportunity I want to take. So that's why I reached out. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm sure this is going to be um, interesting. Yeah, so the book is about like self-actualizing, right? So reaching one's full potential um i haven't dived into it too much to be honest yeah um we kind of organize this real quick but um yeah what like do you think are the main barriers that are like stopping people reach their full potential yeah it's a great question so the way we conceptualize self-actualization in the book is is both um individual actualization and systemic actualization. So I argue those two things are a component of the larger self. Uh, and I can kind of get into to why in a bit. But when we talk about barriers, you know, there is, um, I call it the age of crisis in the book. It's commonly referred to as the meta crisis, right? There is, you know, we, we live in this challenge of our immediate present is at the same time, the best time to be alive ever, right? It's, it's never been, uh, there's never been a better time to be alive, to be creative, to just, you know, uh, take part in collective progress while at the same time we're surrounded by a, a wide variety and direction of crises some of which are existential some of which threaten our species um, at the most fundamental level so I, I think when we talk about what are the primary barriers to individual actualization today because I, I use that in the, the sense of what is traditionally referred to as self-actualization um, I think it's because we inherit a suite of systems that uh, the vast majority of us had no say in choosing. And they are based on frameworks of being, frameworks of, of what being a human being should be, frameworks of value and meaning primarily, that do not meet the needs of the moment of today. So the book is less of a criticism of you know, what they've brought to us in the past, but more of a recognition of, you know, we are in a, a wholly unique circumstance in terms of human history. Um, both, you know, in the terms of the crisis, uh, as well as our exponential progress, right? We're, we're finally unlocking Pandora's box, for example, of self-learning machines, which is going to radically transform human uh, you know, agency, capacity, just the fundamentals of life. So, the, but the, the core challenge is that the systems that we inhabit, the vehicles for change, when I say systems, right, a system can be any, any human creation that governs relationships between people. So in the book, for example, I talk about law, economics, politics, uh, spirituality. These are all frameworks for governing how you and I, the individual and the other, act in relationship to each other. Now, 
I would make the argument, and I do in the, the book, that all systems bear the imprint of their moment, uh, the moment of their creation in two specific ways. So the first is their intended purpose. I write a piece of software, it's expected to do a certain thing over time. Um, but then there's also my inherent values as a creator, which informs the how of my creation. How does it operate in the world? How does it, which groups does it favor, if any at all? Um, and when we look at the systems of, um, you know, specifically law economics are the two kind of critical ones, whether it be uh, in the United States or, or even global hegemony, you know, they are primarily minor evolutions of philosophies that we're, we're proactively preferring small groups of insiders at the expense of outsiders. So you know, my argument with when we talk about individual actualization is, is to, to free the latent imagination that's kind of trapped in the world today. Um, we have to kind of reconceptualize our most fundamental concepts of being, uh, which in turn influence the systems we create. Uh, and right now we're kind of trapped in these systems that again, you and I were born into. We had no say in kind of crafting this, this global order. Um, but at the same time, we're bound to it. And, and by being bound to it, they resist change by design. They, they stifle you know, alternatives. Uh, and that's kind of at the, the center of our crisis of, of why we can't become more is because we're kind of trapped in these institutions. Mm. So you say the main systems are law, ec like economics, like the financial systems. Are there any other ones? Would you count like schools in there? I uh, also hear people talk about religion as well. Yeah, I, I would absolutely call it schools. That would be like more of a social system. Uh, schools, um, that's like a, a big part of it. And, and part of, so in the beginning of the conversation I shared with you, you know, the self-actualization in the age of crisis is kind of built around binding spirituality systems. So to that extent, um, under the new frame, we create new frameworks of meaning and value informed by some recent discoveries in cosmology and physics, which I think is going to be important to get into in our discussion. But education is one of what we call the eight dignities, which is a, a new proposed suite of systemic rights. Um, the, the question has to be, right, when we think about the future we're in today, the, the question has to be, how do we maximize individual access and agency um, at the greatest scale possible? Because ultimately, the nature of work and the nature of productivity and even participation with each other has shifted to this kind of creative creative dialectic like that's the most advanced work happens in these kind of fields um, so we want to maximize the amount of human beings who can do those things um, today you know because of and, and let's talk about like you know for example economics being one of the primary ones our problem is not that although it, it's a huge challenge and it creates a lot of problems it's not that we we embrace private markets or capitalism like it's capitalism is certainly a problem and it has a lot of negative ills baked into it but our our problem is not that we use private markets in that framework but it's that we dogmatically adhere to only using it whereas the alternative would be to have alternative frameworks let's say of property and contract operating side by side so you might have capitalist markets operating next to socialist markets operating next to, you know, hybrid markets, et cetera. So, and I kind of detail this a lot in the text, but education is a core component of that. It's really the cornerstone, I, I would argue, of, of individual actualization is kind of elevating the collective, but also changing both the character and content of education. Uh, much of our education and, um, you know, I don't, I can't speak too deeply about your specific education, at least in the United States, um, is very much a product of the industrial era. It prioritizes obedience and memorization, um, neither of which are desirable for the most advanced forms of work today. Mm. Yeah, I heard, um, I think, well, schools originally came out of the fact that it was like um, uh, like childcare for the, the people mm -hmm. working in the factories. So yeah, if you if you see where it came from, it, it's, uh, it's quite interesting, yeah. What, what would you say like specifically are the main crises or are you going to say something else then no no i'm happy to dive into the crises um so i i say there's six specific crises right the, the first is um the crisis of extinction right pretty much the, i think the most obvious to many of us um we're on this like exponential curve of uh, environmental you know, challenges disasters much of our own doing um nothing about the current systems is doing anything to stifle it in fact we're 
proactively furthering it. New oil permits are being you know issued as we speak, right? Uh, new drilling is taking place. Um, we are experiencing natural disasters at a rate of 10 times more frequently uh, around the globe than we did in 1960. So in 60 years, a 10x increase in natural disasters. Uh, oceans are evaporating, deserts are expanding, fires are shrinking, so forth and so on. What's not as often talked about in terms of the crisis of extinction is the mass animal extinction that we're experiencing. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the midst of a six major uh, species-wide extinction where the estimates are that 70% of the species surveyed would, would be extinct uh, in the next few decades. So um, I think that's that's a really traumatic one. And it's also going to shift like in combination with the changing climate, it'll shift the way food is grown and where it can be grown. Uh, and then obviously there's the water component, right? The water is the key component, which was going to be a major source of crisis in the not too distant future. Uh, so that's the first one, the crisis of extinction. Um, the second crisis I talk about is essentially the billionaire God King. Uh, the idea that I, I make the argument in the text that we will never be free in a class society. Okay. When you have, when you embody and you, you are beholden to institutions that create insiders and outsiders by design, then you have a society that prioritizes birth lottery as the most important event in our lives. It is statistically accurate that if you were born in extreme poverty today, for in the vast majority of cases, you will expend your entire life in that economic class. Okay, so what are when we talk about self-actualization in the age of crisis and the embrace of, of new frameworks and meaning and value, ultimately it's to free the individual from the 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 randomness associated with their birth lottery, which in many ways kind of constricts them to a very specific path in our immediate present. Um, so that's the argument of against the billionaire. It's not about, I want to emphasize, and, and we can dive deeper into it if it's of interest, but it's not about being anti-luxury, okay? And it's not about like anti-merit. It has nothing to do with that. It is that the fact that a, a billionaire is a class structure. And more importantly, the, it gives immense powers to control networks within society, productive verticals, to a very small, small group of, of insiders. Um, with outsized impact, you know, for the rest of, of the people being impacted. Um, the an additional crisis is elected misrepresentation, essentially, in one sentence, the world is full of weak democracies, many of which are under corporate capture, um, so, or, or for-profit capture. So there's no actual representation. Um, statistically, we know in the United States, uh, for example, um, the vast majority of, like, Populist bills do not even get passed or concerned, but the, the vast majority of bills that go through our Congress uh, and are approved are pro-business, pro-corporation, primarily the, the influence of lobbying. Mm. Uh, there's the crisis of information, truth, and trust. So essentially, uh, throughout both mine and your lifetimes, we have been subject to a nonstop stream of of essentially commercialized propaganda, where our attention has always been purchased, right? There's always been something to, to want, something more to have. Um, much of it focusing on othering, like comparing ourselves to the other. Oh, that person's got that nice car, right? Like, I don't, and I should feel bad about that, right? Um, and, uh, and now, I think more so now than ever, um, it's really, you have these for-profit propaganda machines that are just you they they always have to exist on the fringe of sen sensationalism it always has to become more sensational to kind of keep the audience coming back right to keep them more angry or more frustrated um and that's obviously as you might imagine warped our our perceptions and our relationships both with ourselves but with other people mm. um yeah i just quickly add there um yeah not too long ago i saw it was like a graphic of how I think it was in America, like, um, Democrats and, um, conservatives have become like more extreme on both sides. Like oh, yeah. I think it was like 20 years ago, like before social media, uh, they're, they're more centrist and now more, it's like going further and further apart on average. Yeah. And to, to the point about centrism, I'm not personally a fan of centrism because I would argue that there is no such thing as neutrality, right? Every direction we choose, Every choice we make points us in a very specific direction. Um, so I think the centrist often like says like, oh, let's like kind of find both grounds, but like, let's look at America, like is your example. When you talk about the widening gaps, you have a, a you know, the hard left, right? Which is leading towards a, a, a high degree of kind of public works, public goods, more socialized systems. Um, 
the challenge with the left is that they're they're disorganized and there's no clear vision. Um, and also a failing, I think, of many left is like they're reactionary. Like they think they can substitute one system like capitalism for another, like socialism. So it's like a wholesale substitution. We, we can't do this, but we can do this. I would argue that creates the same problems in the line. It's It's got to be about plurality. It, it's not about replacing one ism with another. Um, but then there's the hard right, right? And the hard right in the United States uh, is certainly trending towards what you know, is commonly argued as like fascism, right? It's deep government control. Um, you know, here's an example. I, I presently live in Florida. I'm renting here. And um, you know, in Florida, they, they, they've passed uh, laws in the last couple of months where you can't speak about LGBTQ issues in any way, shape or form up to in, from primary education all throughout high school. So you have high school seniors who can't be told that other people might be, you know, bisexual, lesbian, gay, etc. Right. So um, you're denying knowledge to people. Um, you're separating families. That's a new bill that just got passed. So you have this increasing like authoritarian creep, as well as the, uh, and this is in the U.S. specifically. We have a, a big challenge with, um, you know, th- uh, theocratic sects of our population, deeply fundamentalists who believe in, frankly, religions. And when I say um, this is a central part of the crisis and the next one I'll get into. It kind of bleeds into it. Uh, the crisis of death, uh, doubt, desire, death, and dogmas. When we talk about uh, death and, and dogma, you know, the vast majority of systemic influence that we inhabit today draws from philosophies of meaning and value based on the salvation narratives. When I say salvation, it's the idea that you go to heaven after you die, right? So uh, I make several arguments in the book, but the first is that all the salvation narratives, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam, are all manuals of war by the most literal sense. Their texts are about the conversion of outsiders and the reclaiming of Holy Land. This is in all three of the texts. Um, so it gives you a spiritual mandate to other, to make another person less than, to make them an outsider, and then more importantly, force a framework of dominion upon them. So if you do not convert, I will put you to the spear. Right. You are in our holy land and therefore you are worthy of being conquered. Um, So that that influence, that that framework of meaning and value is at the root of the institutions we inherit today, primarily our law and economic organization. Based on religion, you say. It's not it's it's informed by religion, if you will. So like the it's not I don't say based on, but I say informed by because spirituality, spirituality systems, religions provide us frameworks of meaning and value. So they provide us a way of looking at the world and and seeing the world that is both unique, but also shared, right? It's unique to us. And they're values that we like deeply embody. So in many ways, it's not that we, when we think about our meaning and values, it's not something that's like constantly in our head, but something that over time informs our interactions with the world and with others, right? So if I believe, let's say for example, I believe that um, if you are not a Christian, then you are absolutely going to hell no matter what. Now, I don't believe this. But if I did believe that, and many sects of Christianity do believe that, then I would treat you with a different approach than I would if I viewed you as equally divine as myself. Does that make sense? So yeah. just in my the way I speak to you, the way I interact with you, the way I might try to transact with you, um, all of these things would be influenced by that. So my argument is that we're kind of beholden to these salvation narratives, which is why the spiritual renaissance is necessary, because I'm putting aside all their past, the good and the bad they've done, they're failing to meet the needs of the moment. These frameworks of othering, these frameworks of spirituality are in many ways responsible for the crisis and only serve to kind of further us down that path. Mm. Is that most of those religious groups? Because... I don't know. I'd I'd say there's some quite a lot of good things from religion, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm not here to deny that there have been positive things out of religion in the past. My argument is: Do these frameworks of meaning and value that these spiritual systems present provide a meaningful method of transcendence in our immediate present? Okay. When the immediate present component is is very important because uh, that's the cosmological and and, and you know. Uh, the, the spiritual framework that we've developed in the text is essentially based in cosmology and physics. So it's a nature rooted authority. Now, when we talk about, is it all groups? Of course not. Right. Most, most people, regardless of their religion are good people. I strongly believe that. Um, however, 
You cannot embrace any of the salvation narratives without being selectively hypocritical about what you do and do not take literally. Okay. And the problem that we have in the immediate present is subscribers of all of the salvation narratives have their own unique hypocrisy. So there's no, there's no even consistency across the board. One group might say, well, people who are you gay are, are welcome. Uh, others might say people who are gay are going to burn in hell. Okay. And both of them are making the same interpretations from uh, different interpretations from the same text, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. So again, it's selective hypocrisy. Um, you know, some might say that, um, you know, to be uh, transgender is an abomination. Um, others might say they're welcome as a creature of God, right? Again, same interpretation or excuse me, different interpretations from the same text. When I talk about selective hypocrisy, it's because it, ultimately the people embodying the salvation narratives often, and, and not all people, so but the people who are doing the negative things are proactively choosing discrimination. So they're making that choice. They're saying, I, I've read this text and I'm going to use it to, to diminish another person, an other, someone outside of my group. Um, but they don't do it to the false extent, right? They, they won't do it to the points where it might harm their wife or their daughter or et cetera, but they'll do it to the extent that it harms someone who is typically a minority group, typically an underrepresented group, typically someone who's already on the fringe of society. I mean, this is a common historical theme throughout, right? You blame a ton of problems on the other, uh, and then you persecute them as a means of solution when in reality it has nothing to do with them. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So you're just kind of saying that some people use religion as like a justification for negative actions. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, that's accurate in the immediate present, but also historically accurate in, in a great, you know, a wide span of history. Religion has long been, at the end of the day, when you think about heaven, right? The whole idea of the salvation narrative. Heaven is a hierarchical concept. The very idea of ascension to heaven, there is a judgment, okay? What it does is it puts divinity beyond life, okay? It, it, it essentially makes the argument that the most, the greatest expression of our being is both unknowable and unaccessible. And therefore, you must follow these frameworks. Now, the frameworks have all been created by humans, right? So there's these frameworks that you have to create to, to get into heaven, so to speak. But at the end of the day, hierarchical hierarchies in spirituality have always paved the way for moral hierarchies. And so long as hierarchical spiritual narratives exist, there will be moral hierarchies that spring from them. Okay? A moral hierarchy, again, is the oppression of one group for the benefit of another. Okay? So that's the argument. And I, I would argue that in many ways, one of the crises, right, I mentioned earlier, death, um, doubt, desire, death, and dogmas, when it comes to death, because that's ultimately what all spiritual philosophies try to answer, Right? One, of, one of the main things is, is death. We have to give death its due. We have to say death is the end. It's not, there's no, it's not like you're trapped in a void after the fact. Death is the end. It's like going to sleep and wake, never waking up, as many people who have been died and resuscitated have shared. And in doing so, that empowers us to most fully embrace life, to most fully express our divinity in the moment in alignment with the single truth and relational universe. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that much about religions, but I know they have been used to justify bad things um, over history. But I mean, most religious people I've met have been really nice. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's it's not a, um, the argument is not a, a personal argument. It's not about anyone who is, because again, most religions, most people who are religious, right? You inherit that. You're born into that. And it's the path of least resistance is to maintain your religion. Right. It's all the family holidays. There's a lot of uh, so it's it's not a I want to emphasize it's this is a systemic argument. Religions are technologies. They are spiritual technologies. OK, what at the end of the day, they were created. They were created by people. And we can give plenty of examples how religions have over or evolved over time. Right. Um, whether, for example, from Judaism being uh, one of many regional religions. Right. To finding a scroll that essentially said that, no, our God, you know, Yahweh is the only God. And more importantly, that gives us the, the cast his belly, right? The mandate to to dominate the other tribes um, to Christianity pre Lutherism. Right. Like the idea of that you used to have to pay to get absolved from your sins. So you could pay 
instead of, you know, you'd be a bad person and pay the church. And that's where the, you know, Martin Luther's 99 thesis came from. So there's, you know, there's a lot of good people. It has nothing to do with the people. The argument is, is the systems that we inhabit are proactively stifling our capacity to kind of meet, to transcend the crisis. They're part of the problem. Um, and they are proactively working against the alternative, which, and that's been our biggest problem, right? It hasn't been that we're here. It's that for so long, we've kind of lacked alternatives. Um, so I'll speak, if it's all right with you, just speak briefly about the alternative. Like what is cosmology and physics tell us about the nature of reality? And, and what does that mean for us? Go for it. So there's a couple kind of core points. Um, as I imagine you and, and maybe some of your audience are aware, the universe um, is expanding exponentially. And I mean that in the, the most literal sense, as in the entire universe is expanding exponentially in all directions. But also information is expanding exponentially. Our progress is expanding exponentially. There's exponential growth in a wide variety. Uh, in the book, I detail a bunch of sources and examples. Um, but this is now part of the nature of our reality in a way where it hasn't been in the past. So we've always been progressing exponentially, but now we can see it, we can feel it, right? Um, these AI large language models, this is a, a prime example of like exponential growth. I'll give you a personal example. Prior to last, as of last month, I had written like one Python script. You know, I was a real, real novice. Since ChatGPT4 came out, I've built two web scrapers, uh, a web-based assistant, and I'm working on training a large language model in the book. It's closed about seven years of knowledge gap for me. OK, and this is what I talk about exponential growth. I can do more now with my moments than I could ever do before. Mm -hmm. I also talk about the, the changing nature of time. Exponential growth in, in the nature of information is changing the way we as individuals perceive the nature of reality. And that's because we are ultimately all fractional observers, right? Each of us is a, a, an observer in an informational universe. And we perceive this information through the tools that we have. Uh, and we try to make sense of it the best we can. Now, because obviously you know, information is increasing exponentially and we're saturated with it much more, it's obviously changing us in a variety of directions. One very apparent one is the rising rates of depression, uh, especially amongst youth, um, suicides, et cetera, you know, that, that I think is kind of part of this. Another is obviously the progressive part. Too much information, you think, is a big factor in the depression and suicide? I, I think it's the combination of the exponential increase of information with it being locked into frameworks that are intentionally exploitive, right? So all the platforms exploit your attention because hmm. that's how they monetize it. So again, it, it goes back to that same thing, that information, truth, and trust crisis. It's about sensationalizing, making it about keeping up the other. So it's, it's a form. So when we think about like our interaction with systems, any system, um, it's a process of mutual becoming. So what I mean by that is we live in a, what's called a relational universe. And, and so the idea is that nothing exists outside of itself. All happening is, is in relation to all else, right? This is nothing new. This is um, the Vedic, Hindu, Buddhist philosophy, philosophies, the, the absolute unity of the Atman and the Brahman. But the idea is in a relational universe, any interaction you have, even this interaction between you and I, is a mutual exchange of information, but also a mutual exercise of becoming. We are becoming more in a specific direction through our very nature of interaction. And when we interact with systems, let's say uh, Instagram or TikTok or et cetera, right? I'm not a big social media person, but the idea is that like they influence our behavior in very specific ways. They influence the way we think about ourselves and the world in very specific ways. So I think that's when we talk about like depression, that's a core component of it. It's not that we have the, it's not just information. It's about the way we're framing this expansion and evolution mm -hmm. is within a rigid model of hierarchical profit seeking. Okay. Yeah. It's because it's confined to that model is where, why it becomes such a struggle. Um, so that's kind of the changing nature of time. I also talk about the, the book in, about the universe having a history. And this is kind of like the real core of the philosophy I'm putting forth, right? The Nate cosmology and physics now tells a couple of things that we didn't know as recently as like a decade ago. Okay. So the first is that after the initial big bang or the singularity, when the universe started expanding, there's a moment called the Planck epoch In the Planck epoch, the universe, the material universe existed in a superheated state that was unified. It was like a single whole. And, and, and when I say it took up the entire universe, right? It was, it was one thing. And, over time, as it cooled, 
the laws governing the universe changed. So what we would call like the immutable laws of nature, like they can't be changed, um, like uh, strong and weak nuclear forces or gravity, these things that like we, we, we base all of our science on, right? These static principles. They are in fact not static. They changed over time. And I think that's a core kind of component about you know, the, the is, nature of transcendence. Is that, is that like, um, is there a fair amount of consensus on that? Is that quite agreed upon or is that a bit out there? No, there's, 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 I think, near absolute consensus in the physics community about the Planck epoch and the nature of the laws governing the universe changing over time. Okay. Um, as the universe cooled, the laws began to take the shape that we now presently observe them. Um, but it's important because it, pre it presents a, a framework of understanding where all of our science, our law, our philosophy, even our spirituality is based on these static principles. But nothing about the universe is static. It's always been changing. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of brings us to the second point. There's um, a, a group. Uh, it's not this. This point is not, I think, absolute consensus like the previous point. But it is a growing consensus amount, uh, amongst physicists and cosmologists. Um, a group uh, led by Roger Penrose has essentially uh, detected radiation from black holes in our universe that is older than our universe. Mm. So the radiation predates the Big Bang. Now, for that to be accurate, there must have been a universe before ours. And here we find the philosophy and theory of infinite sequential universes. Okay. If there was a universe before ours, there is equally one after ours. Exactly, right? And for the human being, right, for you and I, the idea of a universe outside of ours, again, you and I, we live in a speck of dust in a universe of trillions of galaxies that we can see, right? So another universe is essentially an observable infinity. It's inaccessible. Like, we can't ever measure it. We can't know it. Um, Not yet. But, it's, but if we have evidence of it, it is an observable infinity, Okay. And therefore, we've, we, we conclude through the, that, that brings us to the single truth. Change is the single truth. If the material nature of reality is infinite, then the nature of being is, in fact, the totality of the moment. So what I mean by that is in any moment, and we can define moment as any period in time. It could be a picosecond to a day, whatever. The nature of being in that is the totality of the cosmos in motion right? Snapshotted whenever we want to snapshot it. But that's it. That's the nature of reality. It's always the, the immediate present. The past is always inaccessible. The future is always unknown. But in an infinite universe, that is the nature of reality. Changes the single truth. All of our knowledge, all of our visions, all of our imagination is bound to that. Because even, you know, we could say in, in the most optimistic scenario where humanity becomes this utopian Star Trek civilization, colonizes the galaxy, etc., I wouldn't use the word colonize, that's probably not utopian, but uh, spreads throughout the galaxy and, and meets new people and others. Uh, even then, in, in the eventual kind of heat death of our universe, that information will be lost. Does that make sense? So in, all of our principles of being will be lost. And the next universe is unlikely to have identical principles, identical frame, you know, identical frameworks of operation as ours does. It'll probably, uh, the physicist Lee Smolin argues that he imagines that they would retain some traits of the previous universe but at the same time have new ones almost like a kid right of a parent mm -hmm. you have a baby and it has it has a lot of your your uh your acts you know your genetics and your coding into it and then obviously it, it takes your mannerisms but at the same time the moment that child is born its path begins to diverge from the parents mm -hmm. it begins to experience reality from a unique set of conscious coordinates that cannot be replicated so i'll pause there that's kind of like the root of the philosophy that we're putting forth and and the crisis as it's a kind of a means to address the crisis and rebuild ourselves around. Yeah, sure. So I've got a couple of things here. Like, so you say that the, the, everything we build in this universe would, would go right in the next one. Well, I mean, I guess maybe black holes are special, but if they manage to find radiation from a black hole that's older, then that would suggest perhaps it's possible for things to go through and, at least somewhat maintain um and then also with like the exponential tech i mean we don't know where it's going to go but if it continues exponentially the the universe might become less infinite um i mean there's no way to know right now um but yeah and then also go on. 
Yeah, I mean, so just to, to, to your points, um, black hole, it has been theorized that black holes can both contain and give off information. And, and I believe the giving off information has actually been observed. So um, certainly possible that, that information in its most pure sense can kind of tr transition between universes. So maybe there's a maybe there's a future human civilization where we arrive at a point where we can encode data into a black hole and then in some future uh, civilization might discover it, right? But if that is accurate, I would imagine that we would be the ones to discover it in this universe, right? Like the idea is that like, I, I imagine that that's part of the thing. And to your point about becoming less infinite, now that's a really interesting point. I'd like you to expand on that because essentially like it's difficult for me to imagine something greater than an observable infinity. Um, and it's ultimately like when we talk about the the reimagination of human divinity, it's about the alignment of the two observable infinities, the universe itself and human imagination. And those two, when we align those in the moment, is divinity, is divinity in the moment. So how do you imagine or how might you see something becoming less? How can something become less than infinite if it is infinite to begin with? All right. So I think it's because you said that we're in our universe with trillions of galaxies that we can see and then the concept of another universe is as good as infinite but not necessarily infinite so it was more that it's just extremely large but with infinite tech and time that we could well, we don't know right so yes could... that that is true we don't know we and can... we have to choose that's that's ultimately it like we if we're going to choose then then you say okay so what else do we observe do we observe, does the nature of reality give us the idea that it is in fact one or that there would be many? Um, so it is a choice, right? The salvation narratives would choose that it's one. They'd say God created the universe. It is unique. It is one. It is created. And here it is. Um, I believe that the physics and cosmology community is on a trajectory to, to say the opposite. Um, and I think the opposite, the idea of an infinite nature of reality, actually more accurately describes our circumstances in the immediate present, who we are, what we yearn to be, um, what we know we are, but kind of remain constrained. So, um, but to your point, and I, I'll, I'll admit there, and it's something I write in the book too, the single truth is subject to itself. So absolutely, to your point, if there was an absolute concrete way to prove that a universe beyond ours was was not, not non-existent, um, then it would not be accurate, right? But based on the idea of it, if it being infinite, um, it is an accurate thing that kind of binds all else. And I think that's when we think about spirituality and like spiritual renaissance, it creates a universal commonality. And that's a core point for kind of uniting a populace around a, a broader vision of humanity. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I would also add to the, you saying how information in certain structures leads to issues. I think, yeah, it's, it's I think also part of it is just kind of deviating from like our nature like what we have done there's many things that humans do well very recently we started doing that we have not done or were not even i guess evolutionary uh designed for which i think adds to the issues and then just one more thing i wanted to bring it back to you said it like a, a couple of times that like religions were like falling short to um deal with the crises of today where do they fall short do you think yeah well i think at the most fundamental they fall short in framing human divinity as a hierarchical thing inaccessible within the immediate present uh, because again against the contrast against a, a relational universe governed by the single truth there only ever is now that's the physical material nature of reality therefore the idea that divinity that the so like ultimately when you talk about like ascending to heaven, it's a it's an ascent, it's like a, a vision of, of of becoming God. It's like a vision of becoming on that plane of existence. Whereas I would argue that that's that's a false narrative for transcendence. It's about becoming more godlike. We are human, we are fractional. Each of us embodies a unique conscious coordinates, right? And there's there's aspects of that that we cannot escape. We're going to die, right? We're going to feel doubt. We're going to want things, right? These are inescapable components of being human. The question is, how do we surround ourselves with systems that you know, deal with these issues, right? And when we think about the you know, religions and not meeting the needs of the moment, we can start by saying, well, what, what moments were they created for, 
right? They were created, um, Judaism in a Bronze Age, but Christianity and Islam in the Iron Age. They were created to meet very specific problems of a populace who existed in a very specific time experience, right? A conscious coordinates, to be frank, far distant from you and I, right? Far distant of all of these modern technologies, of plumbing, of refrigeration, of the things that we take for granted of running water, right? It was a very, very different human time experience. So when you talk about, again, kind of going to the point I brought up in the very beginning, all systems essentially are are perpetually bound to the moment of the create, creation, right? They bear the imprint of their creation. Uh, and from the moment of their creation, they begin to deviate from their purpose. So the problem is now when we look at like modern religious institutions, so in the immediate present, what's the most common thing? You know, what we, what we know right now with these philosophies is that A, many of them, is, and again, I'll focus primarily on the salvation narratives, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, uh, Taoism, all, there's a lot of other like religions that provide some really great context. And um, there's a great book by Roberto Mangibar Unger that does a, a kind of a breakdown of how each religion answers the three core questions of human spirituality, which is death, groundlessness, and insatiability. I won't go too much into it. Um, they each kind of fail at a specific point, but the salvation narratives are the, the ones that I primarily focus on because they have the largest systemic influence which is really important. It's like they, they have dictated and influenced the people designing the laws that we surround ourselves with. Um, so ultimately, that's the first component is it, they don't provide a framework for, for recognizing human divinity as it exists, as, as the nature of reality tells us it is, this infinite being. If the nature of the universe is infinite, then we are in fact both of that infinity and within it. So it's part of us. So the question is, how do we maximize our capacity to exercise that? Uh, in the immediate present. And how do we elevate as many people as possible to do that? The present dominion frameworks don't provide that. What they do is they provide a very specific set of rules that is intended to favor an in-group and, and you know, essentially oppress an out-group. And that is no more clear than in the United States where uh, the you know, religion and politics essentially is blending. I think it's just Texas that just passed all, I don't know if it was a, the Senate passed a bill yesterday to require the Ten Commandments in all of their high schools be shown. So there's no, like, it's an illusion to think about the fact that a dominion religion can in any way, shape, or form not seek to convert others. That's part of its core. And that conversion historically has been done through uh, coercion, through subjugation, through violence. Okay, and it's the same thing we see today. It's just in a different form. Now, again, I'll bring it full circle. This is not a critique of every person who's born into these religions, celebrates these religions, leverages the, these religions for holidays and tradition. It's not about that. It's about the fact that by embracing these, even if you do it kind of on the on the the mainstream, where you kind of ignore all like the hypocrisy and you ignore the violence and you ignore the oppression of minority groups, which is you know, to be frank. I think against the tenet of those, those spiritual philosophies, but again, selective hypocrisy. Um, your our very embodying them perpetuates us towards the crisis because it furthers otherness and it fur furthers these philosophies where the strong will survive, the weak are meant to be dominated, the in group is meant to be on the top of the pyramid, and everyone else is meant to serve them. I mean, this is a very common theme in all of these these spiritual these hierarchical spiritual philosophies um and when we think about the crisis the only way out of this like crisis is deep cooperation and coordination it's not about independent heroes who are going to come save the day and become billionaires no it's about like the mass uprising of people to build public work system that free us from the constraints of birth lottery right that don't that don't i mean you're in the uk if i'm correct is that accurate right so you know this may not be something that you're super familiar with, but in the United States, right, more more than half our population is doesn't have health care and is living paycheck to paycheck, right? So if they get fired or if they have an accident, they're they're in destitution. If they break their leg, their choice is to go in permanent debt or or not get it fixed, right? So this is and this is by choice. I think this is a core component. These systems are by our choice. So. Again, when we kind of go, when we embody hierarchical narratives of spirituality, 
we can justify the treatment of people, of others, to this degree, where some of the U.S. population is so deeply in abundance, right? The billionaire, if they spent $1,000 for 24 hours straight for an entire year, couldn't spend a billion dollars, right? The math doesn't do it. But the the vast majority so uh, let's say the let's say the majority at least like 60 percent of people are listening living paycheck to paycheck in the united states and and they're working minimum wage jobs you know so it's like they're they're on the fringe of destitution at all times and anyone who's ever been if you've ever had like deep struggle you know that that physically changes the nature of re your reality right you're stressed you're not able to think uh you know deeply about topics you're more worried about just kind of Where's the food? It's like a survival mode. Mm, mm. Okay. So it, until that, that is like ultimately like the core kind of conflict. It's at their root. It's their root principle, right? Not to mention again, the fact that you have to embrace them with a selective hypocrisy, the fact that they don't, they're, they're uh, the institutions that support these things, right? Have a long history of pr protecting heinous crimes, right? Primarily on against children, um, there's just you at the end of the day it's it's the we're bound to them more about more by dogmas than we are about logic or what is ideal uh it's just about when we think about like spiritual renaissance it's about diminishing the influence of the past on our immediate present because again that is the nature of reality in a universe a relational universe governed by the single truth mm. so you think like religions have been useful but they've kind of you think for the next stage of human progression, they are not useful. Yeah, well said. Again, I'm not diminishing that like good has come out of the people who have subscribed to these beliefs in the past or even in the immediate present, right? Plenty of religious people are charitable. They do a ton of charitable work. They do plenty of good things. I'm not denying that. And that's not what this is about. It's it's the larger structural argument of are these the, are these the ideal frameworks of meaning mm -hmm. and value that we could be embracing as human beings given our place in the immediate present, given that we're creating self-learning machines, given that we are, you know, we frankly, we live in an era of abundance, but that abundance is trapped, right? It's trapped in the hands and the systems of a few um, where the vast majority of people, um, and you and I, you know, let's be candid, right? Super fortunate to be born where we were, in the country we were, with like the, you know, uh, highly industrialized, highly, you know, education, like a lot of things that many people our age did not have access to. Right. Simply because of where they were born. And I would argue that that every child is a tongue tied prophet. Right. No child is less defined divine than another. So then why do we allow our creations to dictate their access and agency to life? Why do we intentionally limit some for the benefit of the other? When the, that, that's a choice, like it doesn't have to be that way. That's a policy choice. That's a that's a systems choice that we make. Um, and, you know, of course, all of our systems support you know, the status quo. They resist their own revision, right? And that's a core part. When we talk about systemic actualization, in the book, I break down self-actualization into individual actualization, the development of I, and systemic actualization, the development of we, you and I, right? And that's where the new suite of rights comes from. Um, but you know, ultimately, when we think about how do we... This is like, for example, like the ultra libertarian would argue that like they, uh, it's all about them. They should do whatever they want, right? I mean, throwing aside the, the, the ridiculousness of some of the arguments that are made in that kind of camp, ultimately, the individual is most free when collective imagination is most greatly hardest. We most greatly benefit when more people can create and more abundance can be created. Right. When you have this system that that intentionally makes sure that most people can't participate, that's not ideal for individual greatness. Uh, you know what it is ideal for is a certain group of individuals who concentrate an immense amount of wealth and power to dictate the narrative, dictate the structure, dictate the law, etc. A long answer to your short question, but obviously I get excited about this stuff. Yeah. No, it's good. Yeah, no, I think there definitely is like you say with like there's a large concentration and of like power and stuff and yeah what do you think then like about hierarchies generally just need to what what's what is the alternative because i don't think you could just completely get rid of them i don't think that's going to work yeah yeah i i agree and i want to be clear i'm not for getting rid of hierarchies i think they have their place the the argument is not the abolishment of hierarchy it's 
to stop our dogmatic embrace of it as the only thing we can do, the only way we can build systems, the only way we can organize ourselves. My argument is that there's a place for hierarchy, but there's not. So let's give an example. The eight dignities are a suite of systemic rights, systemic public works, independent of any state or nation. Okay, that's a key component. We cannot allow elected representatives or unelected representatives to have the ability to take away what we consider rights for ourselves. This is a huge problem in the United States, right? Every every new, re I mean, in the United States, we don't have two political parties. We have a single corporate infrastructure party, right? That has two different names that essentially fights over varying social and fringe issues, right? Mm -hmm. But they structurally and systemically, they support the same initiatives. But let's let's take it from the point of- it's an Interesting way of putting it. Of like the US, like the, yes, right? The big thing is always like healthcare, right? You could, have, between one presidential administration or another, your entire health care rights could be taken away. This is happening today in our immediate presence to people who identify as transgender. In, in the state of Florida, they no longer have access to medical care. They no longer have access. They, they could be taken away from their parents. And I'm not like, this is not sensationalism. This is quite literally the laws that have been passed in the last month. So when you allow the state to infringe or the nation to infringe on your rights, you're, you're kind of buying yourself. So I would argue that the eight dignities are uh, food and water, housing, uh, education, information, transportation, communication, and energy. Um, and uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, healthcare as well. Um, so that's the eight dignities. And the argument is that if we can get, if we can build, and, and much of Spirit Dow, the organization, uh, the community that's kind of forming around these philosophies and practices, um, that's a core, one of our core purposes is to finance and fund these initiatives to build systems that are owned by the stakeholders. So a stake, like a health system where uh, it's owned by the doctors, the nurses, and the patients. It's like this kind of collective thing. It doesn't belong to the state. It cannot be infringed upon. Um, and that gives us the, the capacity to, again, free ourselves from a framework of being that is primarily rooted in birth lottery. So my argument is we shift wealth from the concept of dynastic wealth, which it is today, whereas that your wealth is primarily dependent on your family, where were you born, right? You get these passed down things. That's how society across the globe is organized to, to systemic, to shared wealth, to pluralistic wealth, societal wealth. The idea is you are born today in the most advanced period in time of human history. And because of that, you share in the abundance and are expected to return that abundance you know, in the future. And that's the idea. Um, so we want to separate so like the idea is th those eight things, those eight dignities, they could be socialized verticals, right? Global public works. But let's say there's a person who's a video game manufacturer. That can absolutely be a private enterprise. It's entertainment. It's a private venture. It's a creative venture. There's no need to say that that person can't earn more luxury from their merit and their effort, right? That's mm. not what this is about. This is not about an abolition of merit, effort, or imagination. I would argue the opposite. I think under a suite of you know, systemic rights, there'll be vastly more experimentation, vastly more startups, vastly more creation because today, and this, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who's founded a Web2 company and sold that was a CEO for eight years, right? I've spent the last 10 years in like the nonprofit philanthropy social impact space. But as someone who's been in the for-profit space before, if you fail, you are destitute. In most small businesses, you're like all of your money's in that business. And if it goes under, you have no money, no health insurance, no savings. Right. So there's a huge risk to try and innovate mm -hmm. because there's a risk of destitution. But My argument is let's get we create a, a suite of public works where you are free as an individual to experiment in the direction of your choice, to be most divine, to, to align the observable infinities in creation, in the moment, in your choice. While not, be, you know, while having no fear of not being able to eat food if the idea fails, while not having a fear of not having a home, you know, if your your, your small group project doesn't work out, uh, because only then do we actually free ourselves. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I would just say that's making me think. You're saying that there's this big risk of destitution uh, with small businesses, right? I think it's like most small business fail in the first like. I don't know how many years, but yeah. Yeah, um, two to three. But that's, I think the argument for why people get so wealthy is because like, you know, the high risk, high reward things. Like if you do pull it off and provide value for society and like uh, provide all these jobs that that's where the great wealth creation happens. 
Yeah, I mean, that is the argument, right? But I, I think the, the counter argument is first, when it comes, let's talk about like the billionaire specifically, right? Like the, the ultra, because like, the billionaire is so far above the average individual. It's not about wealth at that point. So first, when we talk about wealth, we have to define wealth. So first off, are you defining wealth as capital or are you defining wealth as like genuine wealth, like the, the well-being of others and the creation of value for other people? So those are two different things. We fetishize the generation of capital. But when we think of capital, like what capital's purpose is in the immediate present, it's a tool for controlling networks of advantage within society. And I think the problem, when you think about like a society today, is that essentially the billionaire class becomes groups of unelected kings. So individuals who have no responsibility or even concern, frankly, for, for public input and, and well-being, have the ability to direct large swaths of this society. Now, you might argue that, and I would actually agree with the fact that like, people who create immense value for, for society should have, for example, unlimited, they should have high access to luxury, right? They can take a bunch of vacations, they can do a bunch of nice things, because yes, you provide immense value. I don't disagree with that. I strongly disagree with their capacity to, to purchase politicians to influence elections, to influence media, to warp human perception, to uh, do a bunch of backroom deals. I mean, there's something like, um, I think of the top 150 companies, I believe there's like a 70% a shared board. So like it's, we, we can't be delusional that these aren't like networks of people cooperating, right? It's like, let's, we have to throw delusion out the window and say, look, this is our circumstance. Um, so Again, the, the argument for a reorganization of what we value as wealth and how we free people from destitution, it's not about stopping someone from having unlimited luxury. It is about, to, it, it is, and I do think this argument, some might disagree, but I, I think I would debate fiercely, is there is a limit to the amount of power one individual should p possess in a global society. One individual should not have the free reign to dictate, let's say, for example, um, you could say Amazon, right? Now, Amazon does two things extremely well. They do their AWS, which is their primary source of revenue, right? The servers that they host things and their distribution network. Amazon is the largest distributor in the planet, right? Now, distribution, you would say, at a certain point, it might make sense to bring that into a public vertical, right? There's a concept that you introduced in the book called corporate modules. So you don't have to rip apart a company to, to socialize a certain thing, right? So you might say, okay, um, you know, distribution, everyone needs distribution. We have to move goods around. It doesn't make sense to have a profit motive in distribution at the scale it's at now because it's already saturated the entire world. The same could be said for shipping containers around the U.S., right? Shipping, our shipping containers, I read a long chapter about this in the book, um, totally inefficient, 30 private companies, um, not streamlined, not coordinating with each other, refusing to upgrade off like these really horrible crude oil fuels because there's no profit incentive. Again, when you frame wealth primarily as capital and like that's the core point, that's the core value, it disincentivizes doing the right thing, to be frank, right? Like at a certain point in time, you have to say, okay, we have a major environmental crisis. We know, for example, that um, nuclear reactors are ideal for ships. U.S. submarines have been using them for, I think, like 60 years now without issue. You know, it's like infinite fuel instead of burning crude oils, right? But, they, but, to, but to install those is obviously expensive. There's a lot of upfront costs. Global shipping, oceanic transport should be a single global public vertical. It should be streamlined. It should be made extremely efficient. There should be no profit motive outside of obviously uh, the the. You know, when I say profit, right, that's that's net. That's post all expenses. Mm -hmm. Expenses include R&D. They include paying people well for doing a job. But again, the idea is why are we allowing 30 groups to extract additional value for something that is, frankly, an absolute necessity for human survival in our immediate present? Mm -hmm. um, so, again, that's a long kind of like deep dive into it. But I want to emphasize it's not about restricting people's freedoms. It's about allowing more people to create that kind of value. Because again, we can talk about the person who creates value and does and builds all these jobs and creates all these new things. But you and I have already kind of come to the point of agreement on that many people, by the nature of their birth lottery, have no opportunity to even try. Right? And if that is accurate in our immediate present, that is an injustice. And that is spiritually immoral in the recognition of the equally divine other 
which is central to the self-actualization in the age of crisis. I would say it's getting a lot better, though. If we go back, like, a hundred years, like, before the advent of, like, the internet, now it's... I mean, obviously, there's still some people who it's very, very hard, but there are a lot more tools of leverage to use to improve a situation, I'd say. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I won't deny that there's been progress, right? The question is, is our present trajectory of progress enough to transcend the crisis? To that, I would argue it's no. I would say that the present trajectory only furthers our, our depth into the descent. Um, we need something you know, radical. And I say radical in the idea that radical is defined as root, right? It is the fundamental cause. And I argue that the, the core challenge of our crisis is the available frameworks of meaning and value that guide our, our you know, belief and relationship with the other. So um, no doubt that there's been progress, but again, the argument that there's been progress is not sufficient enough to, to negate the fact that the, the present arrangements are, do not meet the needs of the moment. They're just not enough. Hmm. Do you think the progress you know, Yeah. So when you when you keep saying like the crisis, do you mean like the the? Well, I think we only got through five in the beginning, actually. Yeah. <laughs> there was one more, right? I, I, yeah. I got there's got a... Extinction, super powerful like billionaires, weak democracies, propaganda, and then like the yeah. Death. The, 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 yeah, I can go into the two. Uh, so the um the the one is productivity and participation, right? So the idea is essentially that um. Obviously, there's the changing nature of work is accelerating exceedingly rapidly. And it's crazy that I wrote this book before the large language models were popular, right? So like chat, if I had to rewrite this again, I, I might make the chapter about, you know, our AGI, artificial general intelligence, because that is going to wipe out a lot of what are presently the most high paying jobs, right? Developers, creatives, things like that. Uh, and that's okay, right? Like we want, we want our technology to, to, to replace routine work. Um, but ultimately, like, the idea is that in the past, right, and I think, oh, and this goes to your point about progress. Think about the Industrial Revolution. There was a shortcut in the Industrial Revolution. When we, when we wanted to rapidly accelerate into, like, industrialization, what we did is we took a bunch of rural farmers and put them in factories and said, pull the lever. Right? That's all they had to do in the industrial age, right? They pull a lever, and that's what they did. And it was very easy. To, that was a shortcut. It was very easy to put a farmer in the factory and say, pull the lever. There is no shortcut into knowledge economy work. There is no shortcut into being a developer or using chat GPT or, uh, although chat GPT is, is incredibly easy or building web pages or writing a book, whatever you want to say, like creative work, there's no shortcut because there's a time investment that you must do. Right. And, and when we talk about a common argument against, like someone might argue against my points is, um, you know, although I think I've expressed it clearly, they might say like what I'm suggesting is anti-merit. And the, the answer is no, because you'll never close the gap between the novice and the master. Does that make sense? So like uh, an example I could give you is as a hobby of mine, I had a 25 year wrestling and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu career from when I was 12 to 20 to 35. I stopped being competitive in my late, my twenties. Um, and I was, I was pretty successful. Right. But there's no way that someone who's a white belt is going to walk into the Jiu Jitsu class and out wrestle someone with 25 years of experience. It's just not going to happen. You know, it's the same thing with a developer, et cetera. So we don't, that's not our argument. Um, our argument is that today, when we talk about the crisis of productivity, an increasing number of people are being pushed out of the most advanced forms of work. They're being dealt relegated to like the most basic work service jobs, you know, like the secretary, the bookkeeper, the jobs that are being automated, they don't have the skills to immediately jump into something else. Mm. And we don't have the infrastructure to upskill them. That's a core component, right? You and I talked about education. In the, when we talk about the eight dignities, education is a lifelong effort. A large part of the chapter I wrote about that is about adult education in perpetuity, right? Like that becomes part of the norm. Um, and when we talk about participation, right, that's just our, our ways of engaging. Essentially, today society is organized around the fact that like we prioritize transaction as the highest form of human cooperation. And the problem with that is it permanently puts the other as an adversary, someone to be taken advantage of. And more importantly, it always puts us on the opposite end at risk of being taken advantage of. So there's always a threat when engaging with the other, right? Maybe not in the top of our minds, but it's there. 
right? When you're entering transactional relationships, strictly from market economics, the objective is to maximize the upside while minimizing your downside, right? And many people subscribe to that philosophy. So that's a big challenge because the way we work, the way we produce, the way we participate in a society, that really means a lot to us. It really means a lot about who we are and, and, and what we believe and how we interpret the world around us. So when an increasing amount of people are, are unable to participate, that's a very negative thing. And that's how also that creates, and, and the U.S. is a great example, right? The, the white working class, often like Trump space, like right, the Trump base, are, are perpetually increasingly more angry, more violent, etc. What is their genuine struggle? Ultimately, the social contract failed them as well because they came from a history of hard labor jobs that were then automated. And there was no alternative. There was no path to escape that. In combination with the, for example, allowing medical companies to fo funnel, funnel opioids into their communities. Their towns in the U.S. were more than half the population is addicted to opioids. Imagine being a child where half the adults in your community are drug addicts. You know? So... This is what happens when you don't provide pathways for alternatives. So that's the crisis of productivity, part, part, excuse me, productivity and participation. And the final one I'll, I'll, I'll breeze through. Um, doubt, desire, death, and dogmas. We talked about death. Doubt is essentially, doubt and desire are one and the same in that like the systems around us manipulate those components of us. Human beings, I think, are always going to doubt. And we're always going to want things, right? We're going to want something. What doesn't have to be is that we do not have to surround ourselves with systems that maximize and exploit those components of our humanity for profit, which in our immediate present are all of the institutions around us. Okay. So that that's part of that crisis and dogmas like the, the biggest crisis around the three, right? Doubt, desire, and death is our dogma surrounding them. It's that we believe that we have these static solutions. And despite the fact that they're not meeting the needs of the moment, despite the fact that they're not enough, we cling to them because they're part of our identity. I think about like the propaganda in the US, how it's like words like communism and socialism are like spread with such hatred. When all they are is, is an economic technology. It's like hating a hammer. You know, but it's it's a philosophy of otherness. It's a philosophy of identity. The fact that we attach our identity as infinite individuals, right? A fraction of the totality of infinity. We attach our identity to our creations. And in doing so, we give our creations power over us, a power that they don't deserve, right? So the argument is that our dogmas are preventing us from essentially taking power over our creation, saying, you know what? No, they're not enough. They're part of us, yes, but they'll never be us. They'll never be enough. So we have to develop a culture in alignment with the single truth and relational universe, in alignment with an exponentially expanding universe of perpetual change and self-revision in our institutions because humanity is going to change now more rapidly than ever before. And the present institutions, again, seek to pervert, preserve a static status quo. And nothing about the universe is static. So that's a major conflict. So that's the kind of core of the crisis. Yeah. Okay. I think the reason... I know, people... I'm giving you a lot, Owen. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to think. Yeah, it's like people... I think the reason people don't like socialism or communism, whatever, they, they think it doesn't work, I think, and they have, like, ideas attached to what that's going to mean because I think people will just look at history and the track record isn't great to be honest yeah and well said and um i do agree with you i mean obviously right like the track record isn't great but were those society truly organized as you know socialism i mean national socialism was fascism right like uh it was it was used to kind of uh to, to recruit people but again my point is i agree with you on that point and even with those people I don't advocate for the wholesale substitution of capitalism for socialism. I ad advocate for the allowing both institutions to operate simultaneously because there's nothing about law that says we can't do that, right? It's just a choice to not do that. It's a choice to remain dogmatically attached to one version and vision. Um, and, you know, I can't help but feel 
a little sadness when I think about those situations, because most oftentimes, I mean, if I'm speaking candidly, let's talk about like socialized healthcare, right? Something that, what is the US? I think th there's 36 industri 37 industrialized nations that have universal healthcare. The United States is the only one without it. Like it's big, it's critics, are some of the people who would benefit the most from it, right? But again, this is the problem with our crisis of information, truth, and trust. It's developed dogmas where they deeply attach and embed their identity to a philosophy, even if it self-harms them, right? Even if it's it's not ideal for their personal circumstance. Uh, and that's why, you know, that is why I think the new frameworks of meaning and value are, are kind of the core component of our problem. If we can reorient up the nature of being, that gives us a nature-rooted authority, I don't know if you're ever familiar with uh, Terence McKenna. He talks about the archaic revival. A little bit because of, yeah, so because of Akira at the Dawn. I was going to yeah. ask you about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, oh, I'm happy to talk about Akira. Big, big fan. Um, but yeah, he, um, you know, so Terence McKenna's argument is that like the spiritual journey of humanity, right? We've been, it's been, we spent 280,000 years as nomadic hunter gatherers, 280,000 years, anatomically modern humans. So like a baby born today, identical to a baby born 280,000 years ago, hunting and gathering. It's been approximately 12,000 years from like planting seeds for the first time to like sent, like covering our earth in satellites and sending rockets into space, right? That's a major leap in a very small amount of time. Um, and in many ways to get to this immediate present, Perhaps, I'm not saying it's accurate, but perhaps we might argue that high, like rigid hierarchy was necessary. I don't know if that's true, but here's what I know. It is what the past is, right? Mm -hmm. And it's unaccessible. So you can't change it. So to me, I'm not really interested in arguing whether or not it's true. Let's, you know, whatever. We can't know. But, so it's not yeah, we do, exactly. We don't know if it's true. Um, but there comes a point in that journey where we have to return to what we are, which is this collective heart like embodiment of nature now nature to us today is obviously very different than nature to us twenty thousand years ago right very very different but it's still nature nonetheless the universe is nature you know it's just a different it's a, a deeper extension of the nature than we previously understood um and ultimately that's what it is and, and i argue that's that's core to the human spiritual journey is kind of this return and embracing the single truth and relational universe are a direct path to do that, again, informed by our most advanced cosmology and physics. It, it synthesizes science and mythology in a way that hasn't been done. Hmm. Yeah, um, I think I think you're right that like there definitely needs to be some changes made to, to things with like mispriced externalities and like monopoly powers. Um, but I think pure capitalism is pretty good like do you know naval ravikant i'm familiar yeah yeah he talks about how he'd almost argue that it's intrinsic to the human species that when you you do a transaction that you give someone something and then you work together and i think it depends on what game you're playing like if people are, f are like desperate and coming out of a place of fear then yeah they're probably going to be more likely to try and screw the other person over whereas if they're in a position in their life where they're more relaxed and they have a bit more abundance, then I think it can be really positive because people are trying to provide value for each other, right? Yeah, I mean, I personally, I think Naval's argument is self-defeating. So I think let's just look at, like, to argue that, for example, like, the pure capitalistic mode is is in any way ideal or creates the most value. I mean, let's just look at the immediate present or even we can look at our history. Let's start with our history because I think it's important. So capitalism, and I'll just use, I'm most familiar with US history, so you'll excuse my ignorance on UK history, Sorry. but um, you know, capitalism has been a source of systemic disadvantage, racial discrimination over time documented throughout the history of the US. I'll give you a great example. And one of the most prolific and profound examples in the United States. After World War II, there was the GI Bill. Okay, so many of the immigrants living in the United States at the time lived in ghettos, large apartment complexes that were poorly furnished, poorly maintained, etc. White, black, you know, etc. It didn't matter. There was a lot of uh, people living in ghettos. After the war, there was promised to be a GI Bill. Okay, so that was essentially the government cooperating with private banks to fund mortgages. That's how American suburbia got built. 
Okay, and that's where essentially a lot of white families, after they came back from the war, got a house, got a job, family and kids, and that's how like the American dream, good times, etc., was built. Now we can argue why were they good times? Well, the rest of the industrialized world was laying in ruins, right? Uh, and we worked. So that's primarily one of the reasons we have like a golden age. But at the same time, at the same time, black soldiers and black families who came back, black soldiers, were denied the GI Bill. So they were promised it, but they were racially discriminated against at the when it was time to pay up. And they had to go back to living in the ghettos. Okay? So the same service as the white soldier, but denied the same benefit, despite being promised it. Okay? So to Naval's argument about, okay, it's the ideal. So first off, it always provides, pure capitalism always provides pathways to discrimination of outsiders in favor of insiders. Always. Okay. So therefore, that's one strike I would say that it can't be ideal because any system that allows for the discrimination of one group to benefit another is not the ideal distribution of advantage. Um, the second argument I would make is that, again, look at the world today. I mean, look at the United States today. If Naval's argument were true, why would the, the wealth gap be forever growing, right? The, the people who are getting rich are getting much, much richer. And the poor continues continue to be much, much poorer, right? The, the people living paycheck to paycheck in the United States is higher than it's been in some time, right? There's a lot of people who are struggling with the most basic needs. So again, it's a fantasy to imagine that this is the most ideal system. This is the most ideal system to favor those who have capital. But if you're not born into capital, or more importantly, you don't get lucky. Listen, I again, founder with an exit. I'm not denying hard work, and I'm not denying like the grind that it takes. Okay, I'm not denying that it takes work to be successful, and that you deserve some merit and, and luxury for your success. I am denying that it is in any way, shape, or form ideal in the context of mutual divinity that I believe in, in the in the recognition of the other as holy as myself, as you or I being the sing, same single happening in this moment, experiencing itself from two different perspectives. And in that case, I extend to you the divinity that I want for myself. And pure capitalism cannot provide that. Pure capitalism must have a permanent underclass. That's how it works. That's part of the system. That's why, for example, in the United States, unemployment is baked into our economic arrangements. There's a great um, economist, Stephanie Kielton, talks about modern monetary theory. Essentially, if you're not familiar with that, it, it allows for like, she encourages um, more public sector jobs that essentially ebb and flow with private sector. So if private sector jobs are down, you have more public works doing, right? Let's go rebuild. I mean, American infrastructure is crumbling. Let's go rebuild our bridges. Let's go build the pipes, right? And employ people that way. And then when private demand rises, public demand shrinks. So you keep full employment, but you balance it. Capitalism is the opposite. We need unemployment, okay, to create labor market demand. Um, there's a great uh, uh, economist, Yanis Varoufakis, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. In his book, he, one of his books, he talks about the first labor market was created, actually, I believe, in, in the UK and in England, when um, you had the king had primarily ancestral farmers, right, surrounding the, the castle. And it was people who had this land for some time. They were farming for some time. And when trade started to happen with the East Indies Company and wool became a premium, the king kicked all of the serfs off the land and used it to farm wool, right? And, that, and what happened was those people then migrated to a different town and started to look for work. And that created the first labor market, okay? Labor markets, um, certainly there's a potential for hiring the best people, but in the form of pure capitalism, they are not an ideal arrangement when you, again, contextualize it in the framework of human well-being. If he's contextualizing it in the framework of maintaining his power and his network, sure, pure capitalism is ideal. But I, I dismiss that argument as a framework for a collective transcendence. Okay. I think you're saying outside of monopoly powers and negative externalities. So why you're saying with the king there, that's not really a... Because the king has like absolute power, right? So I think he's saying it's not perfect, but there is obviously... I think he says it needs to be respected and it has its place, which I think is yeah. kind of what you're saying as well. Like, it, it's good for some things, but not necessarily everything. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. I agree. I think there's a place for it. And I, I am, uh, you know, I know we've, we've said a few times, but again, I, I don't believe in the abolition of capital. I don't believe that you should reduce or remove the opportunity for private enterprise. It doesn't make sense 
to build a society based on infinite change and at the same time not allow people to create change in their own direction. Uh, but what it does do, right, is it does it does say that there are certain things that should not be private enterprises. There are certain things in society that we all rely on. Let's say, for example, energy, right? We could imagine a global energy cooperative if we had the political will and confidence to build the satellite networks of solar satellites to you know, essentially capture the sun's energy 24-7 and beam it back down to Earth via microwave radiation, right, or microwave waves. So, I mean, there's, there's the possibility to create what I would call superstructures to radically elevate our condition that cannot possibly exist within our current institutions. Can't do it. Another thing, too, you have to consider, like, the United States, right? We're the military-industrial complex. We are the for-profit war machine that reinforces global hegemony. So long as weapons of war are tied to for-profit motives, war will not stop. If you socialize weapons manufacturing, you have a very different context for how and when you build weapons, who you sell them to, why you sell them, etc. So again, I would argue that ultimately it always comes down to the same thing. What is the vision of bigness that you believe in, of shared bigness, of shared creation, of shared greatness that you imagine for humanity? And ultimately, that will define what is the ideal systemic arrangement, right? That, that's kind of the, the larger theme of, of what I'm speaking to. And so talking about these global uh, businesses isn't the right word, uh, systems, right? Systems, yeah. Do you propose that these would all be DAOs? Yeah, great question. I, I think the global public works would ideally be DAOs. Absolutely, yeah, I, I suggested that. So the idea of DAOs um, for the audience, the decentralized autonomous organizations, essentially, if we could, for a moment, if you have any preconceptions about crypto, et cetera, just put it aside. I'm not a crypto speculator. It's not about making money. It's not that. What I love about tokenized blockchains is two things. One, they automate much of community functionality and create a radical layer of transparency within a community. So when you talk about a public work system, Radical transparency is ideal. We want to know the costs. We want to know who's getting paid what. We want to know what things, you know, we want it there to be no possibility for backhanded dealings. So that's one thing. Putting on a blockchain um, creates radical transparency. The other component is it tokenizes stakeholders. So it ensures that, let's say, for example, our hospital systems uh, are governed by the doctors and nurses running them, not for profit executive teams. Who are streaking to you know extract value from the system, uh, and that's where again when you have it as a DAO, it can exist beyond the state or a nation, uh, because it could be global. You could have uh, the hospital, let's say the medical DAO, whatever, right? You have a hospital DAO, could have ten hospitals around the world that operates in this collective structure um, and operates as its own like kind of entity outside of the state. Um, you may be familiar with uh, Balaji; he wrote like the network state. Um, while I don't agree with a lot of his political philosophy in that book. His, his, his vision of like creating superstructures that stretch the globe and are networked on a blockchain, I think is a very valid vision. Uh, and I do think provides a really ideal framework for public works, right? Public goods, um, things that you know, only serve the, the public interests and, and no private things. So um, I do envision them as DAOs. That way you can ensure that the people who are interacting within them are doing so completely on chain. Uh, and then they can have stakeholdership, you know, within those, those frameworks. And how would you make sure that, because from what I understand now, a lot of the DAOs that that are or have been are actually not really that decentralized. How do you stop yeah. people just coming in and buying a bunch of tokens and kind of... Oh, good ownership? question. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So um, there's a ton of different tokens. So there's ERC-20, which is the one you're referring to when you talk about buying a bunch of tokens for your audience. Um, an ERC-20 launch is essentially, I create a million tokens and I sell them for a set price and people who buy them, it's like buying stock and more tokens equals more voting power, right? And that creates, to your point, Owen, what we call whales, right? Um, so I'll give you a, a direct example of what Spirit DAO is doing as, and how it might fit DAOs. Spirit DAO uses uh, ERC-721s, which are technically called NFTs, right? Non-fungible tokens. Um, but our tokens are non-transferable. So if you get a token, it stays in your wallet. You actually can't give it or sell it to anyone else. We use that token for two things, to verify who you are in the organization and to verify your access and agency within the organization. I should really say three. We also build merit on top of those tokens. 
So for example, because you can't transfer it, we can edit the metadata over time based on your contribution to give you more access to our resources, to give you higher voting power in specific directions, right? If you are, for example, um, here's a great example. If you are a doctor and you're part of the hospital DAO, right? As a token holding doctor, maybe you're like a neurosurgeon. You obviously should have a greater merit in the direction of the neurosurgery department than I should as, you know, let's say the cafeteria worker. Now the cafeteria worker should still have some merit and some stakeholdership in that organization, right? They might have advanced stakeholdership in the food operations, et cetera. But the idea is that you can leverage non-transferable tokens to create a means of one person, one vote, but then extend that vote based on merit. So like it might be one person, one vote, but when it comes to the direction of the neurosurgery department, my vote as a cafeteria worker might be worth 0.5 and yours as a neurosurgeon might be worth three, right? So you can, there's, there's infinite flexibility. That's what I really love. It's, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a great framework. So to your point, I'm strongly against the ERC token, 20 token as a means of organizing DAOs because um, you're absolutely right. Owen. In many DAOs historically, it just turns us into centralized for, for profit ventures. Um, and that's obviously not ideal for a, um, I think, and not with with the DAOs, you probably do what's called an ERC one one five one one five five, which is seven, essentially the same NFT. So everyone gets the same key card. Like that might be access to your buildings and stuff like that. I mean, you can do so much with them. That's why mm -hmm. I love. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question a, a bit about how we're kind of organizing it and, and what I imagine the organization layer to be. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I think like the general population don't realize how. I think potentially transformative the um, NFT technology can and I think probably will be people I think mainly now just hit NFTs and just think it's like buying like expensive JPEGs right but <laughs> yeah, yeah. the actual technology does have uh, it appears a lot of useful uh, use cases. Yeah, I, I am strongly in that camp. I agree with you 100%. I think the problem with crypto in general, right, is you have a bunch of, you know, for lack of a better term, they call themselves DGENs, right? But it's about people who will just do whatever they can to make money um, with, frankly, no concern for the other. Uh, that's not something, you know, I'm not a gambler, so I don't I don't really get into that, right? Like, uh, and But that is, unfortunately, when you hear, I don't know if you follow the space, some guy, just um, a high-frequency trader, just lost... 2000 ETH, I think like last week or a week ago in a scam, 2000 ETH is the equivalent of like $3.2 million. So, you know, some guy who I think it's my understanding that he like worked his way up from not that much money to several millions and lost it all in one fell swoop. And I think that's the problem with that kind of, Ooh, yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if it's all 3.2 million is a lot of money. <laughs> he's definitely, he's definitely breaking the trading rules if he's putting all yeah, his yeah, money I on mean, one trade. Yeah, 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 I think it was. I think he did get scammed. I don't think it was like a trade. I think he got like you know someone misinformed him, misaligned him. But either way, it's like at the end of the day, you know, I think it's per, it's perverse system incentive, right? Like if you're if you're day trading every day, you you're always perpetually conditioning yourself to seek the next profit maximization scheme. Um, and over time, it's not surprising that it might cloud your judgment, you know, or, or make you less, you know, and not even I shouldn't even be critical. I don't know if his judgment was clouded. He, it could have been totally just out of left field. But either way, you know, it's kind of like you, you play with fire, you're gonna get burned kind of thing. They're they're two in the same. Making three million dollars um, is is probably you know just as likely as probably less likely than losing three million dollars you know, in, in this kind of highly speculative trade. Mm. Yeah, um, I think we'll also wrap it up here. Is there anything else you wanna add? Any closing thoughts? Yeah, well, first, I just want to thank you Owen, for, for making the time to connect with me. I appreciate the discussion. Um, I appreciate you. I thought you had some really insightful points, and I appreciate you sharing them. Um, for you and, and your audience, I just want to let you guys know the book is free. So I gave away the book. Um, and if you do decide to buy the book, it does support the DAO community wallet. You can go to Single Truth, S I N G L E T R U T H dot org. You can download for free PDF, ebook, audiobook. Um, you can buy it on Amazon, like I said. Uh, you can also check us out at spiritdao.org and join our Discord if you're into our community. I, I'm working in public. We're still pre-launch, uh, but I do have some co-founding members and we're building some momentum, some exciting things happening. 
Um, and I encourage any of you, you know, you can also just hit me up on Twitter. It's just at Rivers Mind. And Owen, I'll be sure to give you a shout out to this that we connected. Um, but don't hesitate. If anything I've said to you resonates with you, um, if it challenges you and you want to debate, don't hesitate to connect with me. I'm happy to kind of you know, spread this message in any way. Um, so again, Owen, thank you so much. I just deeply appreciate your time uh, and, uh, and the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Some interesting stuff here. I'm not sure I agree with all of it, but certainly... Um... Yeah, certainly good points there. Um, we'll put those links in the uh, show notes. So um, I think that's it, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Right, see ya. Yeah.